Father, we thank you for today, for your grace, for your mercies. Be thou exalted as we start now. We ask and pray. Your presence start with us. Blessed be your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' name. Okay, amen. Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll need you to do this. The assignment. Then we can go to the next topic. Remember we said one mole, you can get the mole of um, CaCO3. And then since you know mole is mass over molar mass, you can use that to get the mass. Since we have a mole, um, we have the mole of um, HCl. Remember we said one mole is equals to molar mass. You can see one mole of this guy, you can see, uh, one mole or two, you can equate the mole or the molar mass of CaCO3, giving us two mole, two times 0 0.07 mole per dm cube, right? Yes. You can equate the molar mass to this in mole, or there are different ways you can try, you can go about it. Remember, the, you get the molar mass of CoCO3. You can say, I think whatever the molar mass is, when you calculate it, the molar mass of this gives us two mole of HCl. Now, you remember that would be, whatever thing you get to be gram, this gram gives us two moles of HCl. Now, how many gram do we have in 0 0.700 mole? Do you understand? So that, that would give us the mass of CaCO3. When you get the molar mass of CaCO3, calcium trials of carbonate 4, you can equate it to two moles of HCl, which is two. Now you can now ask X gram would give us 0 0.700 mole per dm cube. Okay. You now find the answer for X. All you just need to do is whatever thing you are given, find how to equate it. Since you know one mole gives us um, the molar mass. So once you've done that, you can then proceed to volume. Do you understand that, please? Yes. Okay. I guess you know how to go around number two. Now to go on number two, right? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. In doing this, um, there are two ways of solving this method. Um, the, remember, 25 is cm cube. Um, it would be wrong for you to, um, it would be very wrong for you to, equates it will be very wrong for you to equate two with 25 because it's not the same thing it's not the same uh, the units are not the same it's very wrong to equate two and 25 the units are not the same two is in moles 25 is in centimeter cube all right so um that would not be a perfect way to do that uh, you can equate, remember, we, I gave you something about um, mole, that one mole is equals to standard volume, which is 22.4 dm cube, right? So you can equate that. Because they give us this 25 does not mean, doesn't mean we are going to use it. It might just be a distraction. 25 is in cm cube. So... I don't think there's anything, there's, we don't need it in this case. So remember we said one mole is equal to 22.4, all right? So you, that's what you should do. One mole, 
So if one mole is equal to 21.4, that means we can equate mole of this to the dm cube of this guy, of CO2. Now, you check for mole again. We have seven, 0 0.7 mole. We give us what? X. Then you find X. Do you understand that? No. Okay. Um, this is what I'm trying to say. Now, what you did here, this, this is correct, your gram. Now, what I, asked, what I said is this. If you want to you make use of, remember we have a rule for more. You really need to understand those more thing I gave you, those um, equating more to each order, one mole to volume, one mole to column of electricity, one mole to one Faraday. You need to really understand because those are the basis or from where we are coming from. Now they ask us to get volume. Before we can get volume, it's very important we understand that, and they say that STP. Then you come, you go back to your mole. What, um, what definition or what formula for mole will help us in calculating standard volume? And that is where um, what will help us in calculating volume. And that is where we have one mole is equal to 22.4. So that means we can equate mole to standard volume. That's exactly what it means. So what you will simply do, you say two mole. You see, that's why it's always good to write the unit because it helps you to know if you are really on point. Okay, so if, what, if you wanted to do this, what you should have simply done is this. Since you understand this, what you should have simply done is okay, you say two mole is equal to, since you said one mole is equal to 22.4, that means we are trying to equate mole to volume because we want to get standard volume. So we can say two mole, that means two of um, HCl can also give us 22.4 dm cube. Do you understand this correlation I'm making first? Yes. Okay. Now we need another mole. We cannot use 25. 25 is in centimeter cube. 25 is not in mole. What is the mole of HCl here is 0 0.7. So we have to remove that and use, we have to remove that and use 0 0.7. Now, how many dm cube are we going to have in 0 0.7 mole? Now we have the same unit. Their units must correspond. Very important. Units are key, very key thing. So what we now do is, okay, if that's the case, we can say, if that's the case, we can, we can then say um, two, sorry, we can say x, is equals to <coughs> 0 0.7 multiplied by 22.4 divided by 2. So what would that give us? Seven point eight four. Okay, seven point eight four dm cube. Now there's another way of doing this. So this is it. There's another way of doing this. Since we use one mole to twenty, what if you were not given the mole? What if you have the mass? Just the way we have the mass. Now you use HCl because we can we have two mole here. Do you know we can also use CaCO3 to equate CO2? We can use that. I'll I'll do that here now. Now all I just need to do is just say CaCO3, um, giving us uh, what's it? CO2. I will do that because we have done something called mass volume problem. We have done something mass volume that you can equate mass to volume. How do we do that? This is mass. We will equate the hundred gram. Hundred gram of this. We don't know the volume, so it will be equated to standard volume, 22.4.
Okay, so now we have the new mass, which is 35 gram. 35 gram will be equated to X. Okay, so X would give us what? 35 multiplied by 22.4 divided by 100. And that will give us what, please? Sorry? Okay. Yeah. okay. So what's the answer? Seven point eight four. Seven point eight four. So you see now. This shows that what we are doing is correct because we have used different method and yet we are getting the same thing. Now you can use either the mass volume problem to solve that, or you can use the mole volume, the mole equating mole to volume. In whichever way you do that, you are still correct. Do you understand that please? Yes. Okay. Now, um, I think you will really, really need to, um, you really need to have good understanding on this concept, but nevertheless, let's see, really need to do something on them. Um, I need, okay, have you written them out? Yes, sir. Okay. We really need to do so let's see how we can jump into titration. Titration, very important topic, titration. Okay, we, we have started, we started solving, um, we, started, we started solving questions on titration during um, the exam we did, okay, now, um, acid base reactions, acid base reaction. Please write this, write this, acid base reaction. Now, we'll be, in acid base reaction, we'll be looking at number one, um, common acid base indicators and their pH range. We'll be looking at um, acid base titration and um, the heat of neutralization. Okay, now just write this, acid base indicator. So what is an acid base indicator? An acid base indicator is a weak organic acid or a weak organic base. Please write. An acid base indicator is a weak organic acid or a weak organic base, which shows color change. An acid base indicator is a weak organic acid or a weak organic base which shows color change which shows color change depending on the ph of the solution depending on the ph of the solution okay it can also be defined as an organic dye. It can also be defined as an organic dye. That is a weak organic base also. It can also be defined as an organic dye, which has color in ionized states, which has color in ionized states and another color in unionized states. It can also be defined as an organic dye which has color or which shows color in ionized states and another color in an unionized state. Now, examples of these acid-base indicators, we have um, the methyl orange, we have the phenolphthalein, we also have the methyl red, now examples, okay, um, I'd like to clear this. 
Okay, examples, like I said, we have um, the methyl orange, we have the phenolphthalein, and we also have the methyl red. Now, how do we know the choice of indicator for acid-base titration? How do we know? Most times the choice of indicator of acid-base titration most times depend on the pH of the mixture at equivalent points and um, the pOH. Now, when a strong acid is titrated against a strong base, um, at equivalent for a point, the salt formed does not um, undergo hydrolysis, so any suitable indicator can be used. But now we're going to, I'm going to be giving you um, a table. I'm going to be giving you a table that helps us in determining um, that helps us in determining when we have, when we can use a suitable indicator. Okay. Let's see if this is going to work. I'm going to see this. If it doesn't work, then um, I will be first. Wow. Did not work. Okay. Now let's do this. Um, you draw a table one, two, three, four, five, six. Six columns, six. Now we have um, the first one is indicator, the next one is the pH range, the next one is color in acid solution. I said the first one this is. Very what you said. Okay, the first one is indicator. The first row, in <clears throat> the first column indicator. The second one is the pH range. The third is color in acid solution. Color in acid solution. The next one is color in alkaline solution. The next one is neutral or the end point. The end point or the neutral point. And the last one is types of acid base titration. Types of and acid. Neutral or end point? Yes, neutral or end point. E N D, end point. And the last one is types of acid base titration. Okay, under litmus, under litmus, the pH range of litmus goes from 5.0 to 8.0. Yes, I said under indicator, under indicator, you put litmus. Now, from litmus, on oh sorry, under indicator, you use litmus. Now, the next thing for the next thing there is pH range. Fifth pH range is five point zero to eight point zero. When you put now the color in an acid solution is red. The color in an acid solution is red. The okay, color, so this is the pH range. 5.0 to 8.0. The color in acid solution is red. Color in alkaline solution is blue. The neutral endpoint is purple. And litmus is used for when we have a strong acid and a strong base. When we have a strong acid and a strong base. We've looked at this strong acid and strong base when we, um, when we talked about acid and base. If you can remember that, we talked about that. Okay, 
Now, the next one is methyl orange, methyl orange. The pH range for methyl orange is 2.9 to 4.6. 2.9 to 4.6. The color in acid solution is pink. The color is pink. And the color in alkaline solution is yellow. Okay. The end point or neutral is orange. It's orange. And we use the type of acid base titration is strong acid and strong base strong acid and strong base. Okay. The next one is phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein. The pH range is 8.2 to 10. The color in acid solution is colorless. The color in alkaline solution is pink. And the color in acid solution is? Colorless. It's colorless in acid solution. In alkaline solution, it is pink. And it is colorless at end point. Now, the type of acid base titration is strong acid and a weak base. Strong acid. So the, the end point is? The co yes, that's colorless. So types of acid base titration, it is strong acid and a weak base. Strong acid and a weak base. And then last one there, which we have is methyl, or methyl red. Methyl red. It has a pH range of 4.4 to 6.3. 4.4 to 6.3. It is red in acid solution. Red in acid solution, yellow in alkaline solution, orange at end point or neutral, and it is a strong acid and strong base, used for strong acid. and strong base. Okay, now when we talk about acid-base titration, we are talking about, um, when we talk about acid-base titration, we are actually talking about titrating a solution, usually the acid from the bullet into a fixed vol volume of 20 or 25 centimeter cube of base until the two solutions have completely reacted. Now, what we mean is that the concentration of one solution is normally known, while an indicator is used to determine the points of the complete reaction. Okay, now most times for titration, we, um, we use dilute solutions. Uh, most times they are containing 0 0.1 mole per dm cube or 0 0.05 mole per dm cube. Please, let's write this. What is a standard solution? Please write. What is a standard solution? A standard solution is a solution of known concentration. A standard solution is a solution of known concentration. Now, we have two types of standard. 
we have the primary standard and we have the secondary standard. So what is We have the two types of standard I said. We have um, the primary standard, and we also have the secondary standard. So what's a primary standard? A primary standard, please write. A primary standard is a reagent that is extremely pure. A primary standard is a reagent that is extremely pure stable and has no water and has a prime solution is used for the preparation of standard solution so it's a reagent that's extremely pure it is stable and has no water of hydration and has no water of hydration. Please change that thing to um, water of hydrate. Okay, change it to hydration. Okay, now there are primary. Now a primary standard solution is a solution which is we can also say is a solution which is prepared from a non-hygroscopic, non-deliquescence, and a pure substance. Remember, these are concepts. If you remember this concept, these are concepts we spoke about in a... Um, these are concepts we spoke about when we we're talking about acid, base, and salt. Okay? Uh, we said is a, there's a primary standard solution, is a solution which is prepared from a non-hygroscopic, it doesn't stick when exposed to a non-deliquescence and a pure substance. Now, what are the examples of primary standard? Now, examples of primary standard, we have um, sodium trouser carbonate 4. Now, this is what we're talking about. I said a, um, a primary standard solution or a primary standard um, is a solution that is prepared from a non-hygroscopic, which um, is, will not become sticky when exposed to air, non-deliquescence, and a pure substance. Examples of such, we have a sodium trouser carbonate 4, okay, sodium trouser carbonate 4, which is Na2CO3. Okay, sodium oxalate and benzoic acid. Now, the features of primary standard. Number one, high purity. High purity. Number two, stability. Number three, high solubility. And number four, high relative molecular mass. So, these are the features of a um, primary standard. When we talk about secondary standard, secondary standard it refers to a solution that has its concentration measured. The concentration has been measured, measured with titration, measured with titration or measured and titrated with a primary standard solution. So they are different. You might be asked, um, to differentiate between a primary standard and a secondary standard. Concentration of a solution is the amount of solutes in one dm cube or 1000 cm cube of a solution. Concentration of a solution. Now that's what it can be expressed in more per dm cube. This is called, uh, this one is molar concentration. And this other one is a mass concentration. Mass concentration. Okay. Have you written this, please?
Okay, let's look at some materials used in acid-based. Some of the copings. Oh, sorry. Now let's look at some materials used in acid-based titration. We have the weighing bottle, the chemical balance, the pipette, the chemical balance, the weighing bottle that's for measuring out our uh, solutions, the chemical balance to measure the mass of our solutes or whatever substance we'll be using, the pipette used for base, used for pip uh, uh, pipetting 20 or 25 cm cube of base. The burette is what is used for the acid. Sometimes it's 50 centimeter cube. The retort stand used for holding the uh, pipette together and every other, uh, every other materials. The filter paper, the filter paper used for, or you can use the filter paper or the funnel. Um, we use that to, the filter paper is actually used for filtration. Probably we want to get, um, we want to get a residue and the filter from a solution. The funnel for pouring out a solution, you don't use your hand to pour the acid saying, oh, I am perfect. My hand can enter into that small hole. No, you use a funnel. Use a funnel into this. Um, the white tiles helps us to see clearly the color change. The standard volumetric flux helps us to measure the concentration of a solution. And the conical flux helps us in titration. In, uh, when we've reacted, when we've poured the, uh, the, the base, and then we are titrating the acid and the base, the conical flux is what is being used. So we are going to see um, the functions of all these. Let's see some things. Precautions in using pipettes, burettes, and the conical flux. Number one, rinse the pipette with solution it is used to measure. Rinse, that's the first thing. Rinse the pipette. Do not, don't rinse the pipette with water. If you're going to use a base, rinse the pipette with a base. If you're going to use an, if you're going to use sodium hydroxide, rinse the pipette with sodium hydroxide. If you're going to use calcium hydroxide, or sodium trisocarbonate, rinse the pipette with what you are going to use. Number two, some persons suck. They use their mouth for the pipette. Some persons are good at that. If you're not good at it, there's something called the pipette filter. Avoid air bubbles in the pipette. The moment you see air bubbles, what you do is pour it out. Avoid air bubbles when you come in contact with it. Number three, make sure that the mark to be read is at your eye level. What I mean by that is, um, this is it. If this is the pipette, the water, I mean, I said water, sorry. The base is something like this. Now, you're going to be having um, stuff like, do not read this upper. Look at, do not read this part. This is wrong. It's a very wrong way to read it. Where do you read? You read from the lower menis course. You read the lower menis course. You don't read the upper, but you read the lower menis course. That's where you take your readings from. And number four, do not blow the last drop <laughs> on the papers of pencils because they want to be fast. You just take the bottle. <laughs> they want to pour it. Come on, that's wrong. Do not blow the last drop on the papers. Are you done writing this, please? Yes, sir. Okay. Now let's look at the burette. Rinse the burette with acid or allow it to drain after distilling with water. So rinse the burette with acid. Very, very important. 
it's very important that you rinse it's very important that you rinse the burret. The burret should be rinsed with acid, just the way the pipettes, just the way you'll be, using, you'll be doing that for the pipettes. So the burret should be rinsed with acid. Number two, make sure the burret jet is filled. Make sure the burret is not leaking. Remember you are dealing with acid now. So make sure it is not leaking. Take your bullet readings with your eyes at the same level as the measures to avoid error due to parallax. Remember what I told you? I said you read from the lower many scores. Do not read from the upper part. Very important. Do not take your reading. This is it. This is it. You read from the lower many scores from this side where the acid is. There are some other, you'll be seeing reading, you'll be seeing the water in front. You have to bend down a bit to take your reading. Number four, remove the funnel. Oh God, many people make this mistake. In fact, you might be, you might even make this mistake. Always remember to remove the funnel. Remember that if you don't remove the funnel, the residue of a, of a solution in the funnel can come into the burret again. So when you are done pouring it, the acid in the bullet, remove the funnel and avoid incorrect reading. Okay, are you done writing, please? No. Okay. The next thing is this, conical flux. The conical flux. Now, do not rinse do not rinse with any of the solution used in titration but with distilled water wow for remember for pipette you rinse with base for burret you rinse with acid but when it comes to conical flux use a distilled water wash down with distilled water any drop of the solution that sticks to the side of the conical flux during titration wash them down all right. I guess you've written this. No. Let's watch this. Hi, I'm Jared Hyman, an assistant professor of chemistry at Elon University. Today, we will be discussing the proper titration technique using the complete single burette assembly kit available from Carolina Biological Supply Company. This is the first in a two-part video series on titration. The purpose of a titration is to quantitatively determine the concentration of an unknown solution, commonly called the titrand or analyte, by adding a volume of a chemical with a known concentration called the titrand. To mark the endpoint of a titration, an indicator is added to the analyte. Let's review some of the equipment that's needed for a titration. Carolina's complete burette assembly. Okay, this is the burret. This is the burret. The basic equipment to get you started, including a burret, ring stand, and a burret. This is a ring stand. Most times, this is also called a retort stand. The burret clamp. Clamp. A burette is a long, narrow, graduated tube used to add titrate. It has a stopcock to regulate the flow of liquid. Notice that the markings on the burette go from lowest at the top to highest at the bottom. The ring stand and burette clamp are used to mount. Okay, so this is a conical flux. This is our pipettes, a funnel. And these are other materials. Up and secure your burettes. Other materials you will also need include a small funnel to help you fill the burette, a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, which works best for titrations. The shape of the flask allows for more vigorous swirling than a beaker or other glassware and minimizes spill hazards. 
a volumetric pipette and pipette bulb to transfer a known volume of analyte to the flask, a wash bottle filled with deionized water, a beaker or flask of titrant and of analyte, indicator selected for your reaction, a reading card to help read the meniscus, and a sheet of white paper to help visualize the endpoint. To prepare your burette for the titration, it is good laboratory practice to rinse your burette thoroughly with deionized water, then with a small amount of titrant. After each rinse, open the stopcock to allow the liquid to drain out the bottom. If there is a lot of liquid clinging to the walls of the burette, then thoroughly clean your burette and repeat the rinse process. The accuracy of Remember, what do we wash the burette with? What do we rinse the burette with, sorry? Still water. Sorry. That is with acid. And the and the pipette. It's base. Base, correct. And the conical flux. The conical flask, what do you raise it with? Distilled water. Okay. This technique is dependent on the titrant flowing into the flask and not sticking to the walls of the burette. Mount the burette in the clamp, making sure it is positioned vertically, and there is enough room to position your flask underneath the tip. Check to see that the stopcock is in the closed position. Insert the funnel into the top of the burette and fill with titrant almost to the top. Filling exactly to the zero mark is not necessary, but you do need sufficient titrant to complete the reaction. Check the column for air bubbles and gently tap to free them from the side walls. Remove the funnel. Place the Erlenmeyer flask under the tip and open the stopcock to allow a few milliliters of titrant to flow through, releasing any trapped air. Rinse the tip of the burette with water. Empty the liquid into a waste container and thoroughly rinse the flask. It is not necessary to dry the flask. Record your starting volume. It is important to accurately read the volume on the burette. Okay. Did you see this? Now look at this. You don't read this one. It is very wrong. Do not read this part. Look at where you read. You read this lower part. Did you see that? Yes. Do not read this part. Very wrong. Read this other part. This is how you take your readings. Okay. First, note that the liquid forms a concave meniscus because the water pulls itself up the side walls of the glass. You should read the volume from the bottom of the meniscus at eye level. Secondly, it is important to read your volume to the correct number of significant figures. This burette indicates volume to the nearest 0.1 milliliters. With any graduated glassware, record the volume to one additional decimal place beyond the smallest graduation. In this case, record the volume to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter, estimating the final place. Use the volumetric pipette to transfer the analyte to the flask. Add a few drops of indicator to the flask and swirl. Place the flask under the tip of the burette. Record this volume. Placing a piece of white paper under the Erlenmeyer flask may make it easier to detect the color change. Operating the burette requires two hands. One hand turns the stopcock, while the other hand swirls the flask. Practice turning the stopcock a few times to familiarize yourself with how quickly the flow starts and stops. It is common laboratory practice that the first titration is an estimate. Open up the stopcock and allow the titrant to enter the flask quickly. Continuously swirl the flask. As the volume of titrant in the flask increases, the color of the indicator appears, then disappears as you swirl. When the analyte becomes a colored solution, close the stopcock. Record the final volume of the burette. Subtract the initial volume from this final volume to get the estimated volume of titrant needed you think the initial volume was when you used for the acid that's the volume of the burette then when it changed six 
which is the final volume. Now that becomes 16 minus this gives you the average, sorry, gives you the, uh, gives you the added volume of titrants. So you do this the first time, this becomes, this becomes your rough reading. You do that the second time, you do that the third time, then you take the average of this, this plus the three values you've gotten, divided by three. Let's still continue. For this titration, knowing the volume that is a little past the endpoint, subtract five milliliters from that number to get the amount of titrant that can be safely added before a slower addition is required. As the estimate titration shows, a dark colored solution indicates an excess of titrant has been added. The desired endpoint is a pale, faintly colored analyte. To reduce the risk of passing the endpoint, slow down the addition of titrant when flashes of color begin to appear in the analyte. Adjust the stopcock to slow the flow of titrant to a dropwise rate. Continue to swirl the flask with one hand and keep the other hand ready to close the stopcock. When you notice the indicator taking longer to fade, close the stopcock. Rinse the tip of the burette with deionized water and swirl the flask. Record the final volume on the burette. If the analyte remains faintly colored, then you have reached the endpoint. If the analyte is still colorless, then repeat these steps. Add a drop, rinse, swirl, and record until a faint color persists. Typically, Titrations are performed in triplicate. Use the average volume of the titrant required to reach the endpoint for any calculations. You now know how to properly perform a titration. Be sure to check out the second video in this series. In that video, we will... Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, let's look at this also. Okay, um, we have one more, we have Amen. that one. Okay. Uh, Professor Dave here, let's talk about titration. He knows a lot about science, the professor Dave explains. Acid-base titration is a way of determining how much acid or base is present in solution by determining the precise volume of acid or base that will completely react with it. It's like a kind of stoichiometry. On a titration curve for an acidic solution, pH is plotted against the volume of base that is progressively added. As we add base, the pH slowly rises, then sharply rises towards the equivalence point. This is the point where precisely enough base has been added to neutralize the exact amount of acid in solution. When we perform titrations, we recognize the equivalence point by using something called an indicator. This is a substance that will turn a vivid color once the equivalence point has been reached. When we neutralize a strong acid with a strong base, the equivalence point will be seven. If either or both species are weak, this number will vary. For example, let's say there's a solution of sodium hydroxide and we want to know its concentration. Say we react with three molar sulfuric acid with 25 milliliters of the base, and we find that it takes 11.6 milliliters of acid to reach the equivalence point. If we convert to liters and then have conversion factors for the concentration of the acid and then the stoichiometric ratio, we can arrive at the concentration of the reactant. Let's check comprehension. Um, don't worry, don't worry. We don't, we, will not, we don't need to do this now. Tutorials and as often, okay. 
Um, the last one, which I would want us to look at before we Okay. Oh, sorry, 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 not this. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to be showing you guys how to do a titration. A titration is used to calculate the concentration of an unknown substance. Okay. Okay, so we'll need the following apparatus for this experiment. So we'll need a pipette. We have a 25 milliliter pipette here. You'll need a beaker of your titrant, which is your known substance. So in our, in this case, it's NaOH. And you'll need a beaker of your titrant, which is your unknown substance, which in this case is HCl. You're also going to need a beaker for your waste, for when you finish your, tit your um, <coughs> titration. You're also going to need a conical flask, which you're going to use with the barrette. Then you'll need a barrette, and the barrette we're going to use, we're going to fill with our, uh, with our titrant. And then you're also going to need a white tile, because while we do our titration, we want to see the color of... Remember, if there's no white tile, you can use a white paper, um, like an A4 paper, most times, or you can use a plain paper, if there's no white tile. So it's... But a white tile is which should be provided, but if it's not provided, you can use a white paper. So let's know that also. Of our results. Of, okay, and then we're also gonna need phenol phthalene, which is going to act as our indicator. And then finally a conical flask, which is going to hold our unknown solution. And then finally you're going to need a retort stand to just hold your barrette. Okay, so before we start with anything, we need to first rinse all our apparatus. So let's go do that. Okay, so we're using deionized water because it obviously doesn't react. So we're just going to clean our apparatus, conical flask, make sure to clean inside and rinse. And also make sure to clean the neck. Don't clean your barrette because, yeah. Just, we're just going to fill it up with our known solution. Okay, so it's important to make sure your barrette is closed, otherwise your NaOH is just going to flow right through. So we're going to take our NaOH and we're just going to fill our barrette, making sure it's closed. And once again, it doesn't have to be at zero, it just has to be at a reading. Now we're going to take our pipette I'm going to take a bit of our unknown solution and place it in the pipette. So this is the automatic pipette. So I squeeze the bulb and then I put it in here. But he's doing something different. He's putting the burettes. He's putting NaOH in NaOH. That's something I just said in the burettes. That's not correct actually. But he has decided to do that. He's trying to do then using pip, uh, using this for acid. Well, this is another this is another style. But this is not what we'll be doing. We, what we'll be doing is in our burette we'll be putting the acid, and um, in our pipettes we'll be using it for the base. Into my HCl, I hold my one valve and it fills up. This might take a while. And if you look closely, you'll see that we must we must line up our liquid with the line here, and then we know we're at 25 centimeters cubed or milliliters exactly. Very good. Okay, and now we can place this in our conical flask. Let's fill up our conical flask. This takes a while as well. 
And make sure you don't get that. There's going to be a drop of liquid left in the pipette. But don't try to get it out. The pipette's made. It takes that into account. Okay, now we're going to need some indicator. So let's go get that quickly. Okay, for our indicator, we're using phenol phthalene. So we're just going to use, we're going to use the dropper. And we're going to put in three drops of our indicator into our HCL. That's fine. Cool. Okay, so before we can start our titration, we have to first get our initial reading from our, our barrette. So if we put a white tile behind, we measure from the bottom of the concave and we measure to three decimal. Remember, we are reading from here. That is the lower meniscus. Places. So this is about 33.40. Okay, so now we can actually start our titration. So a few things to remember is when you so you must always place your hand around your barrette and then hold the tap. And then with your other hand, it's you grab your conical flask on the neck and you spin. So we just keep spinning and we open and close the tap slowly and let a few drops go through. We just carry on doing that. And I already know that there's at least nine in here, so I open it quite a bit to let it run. And you basically want to carry on until you get a racing pink. Carry on. And you'll see that the pink stays longer the further we go. So you carry on. So you want the rated pink to stay. Titration. Okay, so once we've done our titration, now we need to get our final reading of the point. So if we use the flat tile, we go eye level, remember, two decimal places. So that's 48.18. Okay, so after you've performed three titrations, and every titration has given you a change in volume, you can come up with an average change in volume, which you can then use to calculate the concentration of the unknown solution. Okay, so in our tests, we, after three titrations, we came up with an average volume of 13.665 centimeters cubed. What we need to do is we need to create a balanced equation for our experiment. Now, there's a nice general equation that we can use where we can just substitute our own chemicals to do this and that is a number of moles of acid plus b number of moles of base forms a salt plus h2o and we can basically use this and substitute our own values in there so we know that our acid was hco and our base was NaOH. This means that it formed a salt, NaCl. Now what we can go do is, now we can go and balance it. Well, H, there's two H's on the left, two H's on the right, that's balanced. One Cl left, one Cl right, one Na, one Na, one O, one O. Okay, so this is already balanced. So that means we have one mole of HCl reacting with one mole of NaOH to form NaCl and H2O. So now we can use this general formula to calculate the concentration of the acid. And here you can see it here. So now we can go and substitute our values in. So we're looking for the concentration of the acid, Ca. We know that the volume of our acid is 25 because we used a 25 milliliter per pet. 
This goes over the concentration of our base, which we were told is 0 0.1, times the volume of our base, which is this value over here. So that means it's 13.665, like so. And that is equal to the number of moles of our acid, which is A. So that's 1 of the number of moles of our base, which is 1. Now we can go and do some manipulation, and we can conclude that now we can say that CA, 25 CA, so 25 of CA is equal to, and since this side simplifies to 1, we can just go 0 0.1 times 13.665, which will give you 1. 0.3665 and I'm just going to carry on over here so that means that we have the concentration of our acid we're going to divide that by 25 and we know that the concentration of our acid is equal to 0 0.05 if we round off to two decimal places and that's moles per decimeter cubed and you'll notice i said decimeter cubed even though we measured in centimeters cubed but no you don't it doesn't matter because we used the ratio so the centimeters essentially fall away and that's how you do it okay so I believe you got in a big understanding or you've got an understanding of how we do um, acid-based titration now, right? Yes. Okay, so um, from tomorrow, um, the next time we're meeting, we'll start looking at questions. Questions in acid-based titration. We're going to be looking at questions. How do we solve questions? We just saw how to solve a question, but tomorrow I would be explaining how to solve exact questions in acid-base titration. How to solve questions. How do we solve similar questions? And that is exactly what we need to know. Because um, having done that, the next thing is we should be able to solve some questions, okay? Let's see how our report is being done. Let's see how our report is being done. And then we we'll call it a day from there. Um, look at this. Are you seeing this, please? Yes, sir. Okay. This is a table. This is how your table is being formed. This is how your table will be written as you have the rough reading, which is the first one you did. Now, the final volume, the initial volume was 0, 0.0. They filled it to 0, 0.0. The final volume was 25.8. Then this minus this gives you the volume of acid used. You did the second one. It gave you around 25.50, 0, 0. 0.00. Now we had um, 25.50. So that means at every point, they filled it up. After doing this, you know, the volume of acid in the burette would have reduced. So what they did was they filled it up. That's why you're having 0 0.00 in all this. That's why you have 0, 0.0. Now, I want you to notice something. If you check these values, this is how, I, if you check all these values, you see it's just a difference of um, probably 0 0.3. 0 0.3 look at this one again you have a difference of 0 0.1 look at this again we have a zero we have a difference of minus 0 0.1 now you see we don't have much difference you see that this is very important in fact this is very important this is a key success in your y exam when you are right, when you are doing this, your di the difference between each tighter value should not be much. You should have zero point. If you have, if we have um, 25.80 and the next one we're having is 26.80. Wow. That is so much. That is too much. That is too much. Too much to handle. 
So these things, you must take note of these values. These values are very important. The difference are very important. So all they just did was, you can either use the rough reading or you could just say this plus this plus this divided by three, or you can add everything together and divide by four. And that was how they got the average volume of acid use. Do you understand that, please? Yes. All right. So if that's the case, um, sorry, I'm coming. If that's the case, um, I would just need you to Um, I just need you to do this assignment. I don't want to give you any calculation now since I've not since we've not done that. Um, okay, number one is um, okay, 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 let's see. Just you just you may just need to you may just need to um, to do this. I'll just give you a very simple assignment. So tomorrow we go straight into calculations. Okay. So you can do this assignment. Do this, that's just write that. That will be your assignment. Um, you can screenshot it the way you've been doing that before. Okay. Um, sorry, I have just one more to add. Okay, can screenshot this now. Okay. Have you done that, please? Yes. All right, let's pray, please. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for how far you've helped us. Blessed be your holy name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for how far you've helped us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Have a wonderful time. Tomorrow, we're going straight into calculations. Thank you.